slash and cast. All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with prolific character actor Kevin J. O'Connor about monster movies, books, Francis Ford Coppola, method acting, The Mummy, and more. And as always, if you're listening to this and you feel so inclined, please leave us a review. really helps out a lot. Without further ado, here you go. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper, here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Kevin, take us back in time to when you were a youngster. Were you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? Comic book reader and uh, a little bit of harmless troublemaker. (laughs) Not a fort builder. Okay, this is what I love to read. I love to read movie novelizations. If I saw a movie, I would go to a place called Printer's Inc. And I'd see if they had the, you know, I remember looking for a Clint Eastwood movie called uh, High Plains Drifter. And I bought the book of High Plains Drifter. Then I was also reading, I love to read those, a collection of comics like BC or Schultz or Peanuts or Doonesbury and stuff like that. But I love novelizations of movies, which says something of what I was really doing back then. Ultimately, you were just concerned with films even when you were just trying to read. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So were your parents involved in the arts at all? No, my dad was a policeman. My mother was a school teacher. Is it fair to say you were a class clown when we were growing up? Yeah, you could say that. I had to fill in one of those uh, classic sort of uh, jock nerd, this uh, I'd be the clown, sure. So do you have a eureka moment that you can point to to where maybe a certain play or performance you saw where your interest in the in the arts or pursuing acting arose? Well, this is what it was. I am a quite a bit older than you. And when in the 70s, when I was young, I used to watch in Chicago here, WGN, you know, which is still around. But then, since there was no cable and all that stuff, we would watch old movies, which is kind of a shame now that there's so much to choose from that a lot of younger people don't watch older movies. I remember a younger person said to me, I was talking about some old movie from like the 30s. And I said, oh, you should see this movie, whatever it was, I can't remember. And they said, oh, that's from your era. I'm like, my era? <laughs> 60 years older than me. But we watched all those movies, or a lot of us did, because other than made-for-TV movies, which were plentiful back then, but on places like Channel 9, Channel 32, which is sort of still going on, but with it's got a different name now. They showed old movies, and there was a, a thing called Creature Features and Sarah Night, which showed most of the universal horror movies. And then on Sunday, there would be a thing called When Movies Were Great. I, I'm getting the name wrong. But they would show a lot of, you know, the Warner Brothers movies, Betty Davis and Earl Flynn, but especially Bogart and Cagney. Mm. They would show those, which I loved. And PBS, I would watch... Once in a while, they would show a silent movie on there. I remember seeing a movie called The Last Laugh with Niels Jennings, a famous Austrian actor, German actor. And it was about a doorman, but it was silent. It was a great movie. So yeah, so those, I don't think I had one, but I do remember seeing the movie The Sting in the theater, and that was a big changing point for me. Robert Redford and Paul Newman. So where does your own journey begin with acting? Did you start in theater as a kid? Yeah, I went to a, I did just a couple of plays in high school, not many in my last year, my last two years. And then I got into, thanks to my mom, who was very encouraging and very supportive. I went to a Goodman School of Drama in Chicago. 
for four years. So, you know, at first I didn't know if I wanted to stay there. I was very intimidated. I wasn't very good and because I was so nervous. But then as that first year went along, I seemed to get more confident and get better. And I stayed there for four years. Do you remember your very first time on stage? Well, that would probably be in high school. And it was a play, yes, it was a play called The Male Animal, James Thurber. See, I don't know why in like 1980, we were doing, or 81 or whatever, we were doing like a James Thurber play from the 40s or something. But I had like two lines in my, I think one of, my name was Nutsy Miller. I had two lines, but it was really exciting, very exciting. And just getting that role was really exciting for me. I couldn't believe. I haven't thought about that in a while. But yeah, that's a good question, Justin. I, uh, that's one of the moments. Me. Now that you've transitioned to screen, does your approach differ whether you're playing a character on stage or on screen? It's a good question. At this point, I've done way more on film than I've done on stage. I did a play at Steppenwolf and Off Broadway, but I don't consider myself a real stage actor, you know. Not that I wouldn't want to be, it's just the way right. my path took me. And I was so obsessed with movies, like I said, when I was younger. I mean, I read books. I still have books I have from high school about movies and these British books about British actors and movies and Hollywood movies from the... I, I have this collection, these big, huge coffee table books from like the early 90s on each studio, you know, mm -hmm. RKO and Universal. And that was so in my head. And anyone that knows me knows that I read a lot about movies, watched a lot of old movies. So, in a way, going into movies almost seems sort of natural to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's exciting and nerve-wracking and all that, but yeah. So how did that transition happen for you, that first... How did you go from stage to screen, first job? Well, I was at school, and it was, I think... I don't even know if I was finished. I was almost finished my fourth year. And the first person to hire me professionally was Al Franken. Wow. Senator, Senator <laughs> Al Franken from Minnesota, Saturday Night Live, and he's a great guy. And I did a movie with Franken and Davis. Davis was his partner from Saturday Night Live, if you know that. And they did this low-budget movie called... I think it had two different titles, One More Saturday Night, and there was another title, too, which is always a good sign of a hit movie when there's two, uh, two titles. <laughs> but anyway, I was really nervous, and it was way up in a northern suburb, because then it always seemed like those northern, west, western suburbs were doing movies like John Hughes movies up there, you know, that was the only film. Now there's tons of filming here, but then that was like the thing. I remember this kid, I don't even know his name, he was, I get, he had a bigger part than I did, I mm. just had two lines, but he was like 12 or 13. I was really nervous and I was playing some thug and I think I was piercing his ear. This little smart aleck goes, hey, look at this guy, his, uh, his hand's shaking, he's like nervous about me. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would like to meet you later when this film's over. <laughs> um, so that was it, but it was really exciting. And then this guy and I at school, we write little s sketches and comedy things. And then I sort of did some on my own. And one of those I put on tape. And a, uh agent from New York, she uh, advised me to put one of my monologues I wrote on tape and send it to her. And she sent it off to Francis Coppola's people. And that I got cast and Peggy Sue got married. I mean, I flew out there. I'd never really been on a plane before. I flew out there to meet Francis Ford Coppola. Okay. <laughs> Not only me being a fan of yeah movies but a huge fan of his and so i flew out there nervous wreck i didn't even know it happened so fast this woman from new york tough little new york agent she said get on a plane get your ass on a plane and blah 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 and th th there's a plane right you have a you have a uh you have a ticket waiting at the counter and blah, blah. so i had a friend of mine drove me down there i got on the plane flew there I was in a whirlwind. They drove me to um, the Universal Sheridan, the big black building. I stayed there. And that morning, which was the 4th of July, they took me into Universal in, inside the studio. And I went to an office bungalow and I met Coppola. Behind him, a big poster of Apocalypse Now, like a Japanese... <laughs> Wow. And I barely read the scene. I didn't really know even that she was gone back in time. I never read the whole script. I don't know if you ever saw Peggy Sue Got Married. So I read it, but he he really seemed to like this monologue I wrote. So Coppola would say, hey, would you do that monologue? Do it, do it again. I'm going to bring a couple people in here. So I would do it. 
and this is a true story some people don't believe so he did it and he goes okay okay kevin all right and i left and i was supposed to wait for my ride and i was supposed to leave the studio go outside by the street and wait for a car but i sat on the curb inside thinking this was a real street and it was inside of a studio it was like fake buildings and some guy said what are you doing he said i'm waiting for a race there's no cabs here this is fake <laughs> so i had to leave and get up and go out a few weeks later i got that role shockingly agent in new york was shocked i was shocked anyone that knew me was shocked what a first job Working with Francis, yeah. you know, starting out yeah. basically at the top of the heap. Yeah, I mean, really. I, mean, I was lucky enough through this up and down roller coaster career that I've had as a character actor. I've worked with some really good directors, great actors too, and some great DPs, but I've worked with some really great directors as I look back on it and go, how did that happen? Odd directors too, you know, like some people that have only done one or two movies. Off the top of your head, who are you uh, thinking about there? Michael Moore, Canadian Bacon, which was the only non-documentary he ever made, really. Clive Barker. Yeah, yeah. And Lords had, of Illusion. Yes, and Clive had only done, um, of course, Hellraiser, that he directed. Yeah. The first Hellraiser and uh, Nightbreed. Mm-hmm. And according to him, Nightbreed, there was so much involvement in editing post-Nightbreed that that's not his movie. Right, he had some. I think he had some with Lord of Illusion, too, but then it got released in his cut. Back then, maybe it was a laser disc, the first thing that came out, and then since then a DVD. What was your overall impression working with Clive, just as a director and as a creative person? Very, you know, we're very different people, I think, he and I, but he was very, very smart, very intelligent guy. It was very interesting to see the author direct, you know, Michael Crichton, people like that. That's sort of an interesting, uh, and he was very smart and really, I think he had a real respect for horror. He, he was a fan of old films, too. Just uh, backing up a little bit when you were talking about growing up, did you lean more towards creature features and such? Yeah, well, no, but I equally liked Mm, okay. So many different genres of movies, uh, older comedies, usually older movies. I like newer movies, too. I still like newer movies, but my preference are pre, let's say, 1980. Ah, okay. Earlier than that. Silence to that. Those are my favorite movies. If I were to pick 25 favorite movies, 80% of them would be in that period. So as a layman, you know, I'm a non-actor, but a term that a lot of us hear thrown around a lot is method acting. Is that a technique you use at all? What does that term mean to you? You know, I went to acting school here for four years and was busy, really intense schooling. I mean, I was there all the time. But I had different teachers. I, I wasn't taught that method, but, I, you know, I wasn't at the... Uh, James Lipton does the show from there. But I think that I took what I learned from school and then sort of did my own thing too. Mm -hmm. From reading guys like uh, Lon Chaney Sr. and who I loved and that sort of uh, James Cagney and people I would read about how they are my, one of my favorite, if not my favorite, Charles Lawton. That's what sort of excited me and watching real people too. And not just actors, comedians and things. So my influences were those things. So I don't know if I consider myself a method actor. I try to stay pretty focused when I'm working. I mean, someone that's that is attributed a lot to is Daniel Day-Lewis. Did you witness that when you worked with him? Was he always in the zone, I guess? Yes. But on that movie, uh, There Will Be Blood, Paul Anderson, the great director, great guy, and Daniel, who's amazing and great. It was a pretty small cast. I only really worked with them. You know, I didn't have scenes with Paul Dano or The Boy. Oh, I did with The Boy a little bit. But it was a very, very quiet set. Extremely quiet, very focused. Everybody was really quiet. It's the quietest set I ever worked on, and I really liked that for that movie. For that movie, I liked it because it was, uh, everybody was on the same page, I felt like. It was kind of intense. It was intense. You know, you had to deliver. But I try to focus on what my character's doing, and that sort of helps me with my nerves because I'm trying to focus on where my character's at, what he's doing, what he looks like, what he's thinking. Right. Now, when it comes to you focusing on your character, do you do any work off stage, uh, off screen, I should say, in terms of doing backstories like some folks will do or coming up with your own sort of fictional path to why the character believes what they believe? I do. Usually I hang on a sort of simple ideas with that you know simple i mean a few of them i don't write a diary of what the guy did every second and what he had for breakfast but i do think about those things and i try to get a simple 
what is that famous line from when Brando did The Godfather? He got this image of a bulldog with a bullet in his throat. And if you look at that character, that's what it is. It's a bulldog with a bullet in his throat. So little things like that sometimes. My brother Chris is a really excellent artist. I used to draw a little bit. I'm not very good at all. But I used to draw my characters out. And I, mm. I think I came from a physical parents, what the thing, what the look, how he stood, how he stands, and then kind of go in from there, as opposed to going out in outward. I think I go out in, I think, I mean, it gives me, I think it's a way for me to stand outside and look at it for a second. And then, you know, it's fun once I run around and start adding little bits to the character and how he stands and how he sits and how maybe he talks or how he phrases a, a line. And how he looks is very important to me. There's been times where I wasn't so happy with the costume I got. Not by just that I thought maybe it was wrong for what I was thinking. Right. Kevin, my first personal experience with your work was staying up late during the summer and catching Deep Rising on uh, Stars. <laughs> very so, serious film. Yeah. <laughs> very serious drama. <laughs> What are your memories of that set, looking back? At I, that it, was a, it was a fun set. Steve Summers is a very nice guy, energetic, fun to work with. I mean, I love monster films, too, from the, yeah. um, not only from the 50s, but stuff like, you know, stuff like Tremors or even, I've never even seen the whole thing, but parts of uh, Anaconda I saw. I love Anaconda and Tremors. Me and John Boyd fall out of the belly. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> And you go, he totally got it too. Someone like that totally got that movie, it seemed like. But I love, you know, those 50s big insect or big, you know, yeah. uh, whatever, like them or there, there's a bunch of them, them and the deadly mantis. What's the one with the big rocks? It's a universal. All those sci fi films, like uh, all the quarter mass films from uh, Hammer. Oh, and quarter stuff. mass films. Yeah. They're great. They're mm -hmm. great. I love those. And I'm talking about one of those Universal International films from the 50s. The Monolith Monster, one of the big sort of rock formations. It's great. So I, anyway, I sort of like that. Uh, I, I always love those movies. And so this was exciting. It was to me like more than Alien, the first Alien, which mm. is my favorite of all those movies because I love that movie. It's a great, great movie. Second one's really good too, but the first one to me is... Like, and the character actors in that movie are unbelievable. I mean, the lead is Tom Skerritt, I guess, or Sigourney Weaver. You didn't yeah. know who she was. She was new. And Tom Skerritt was never really a lead. He was the second lead and always good. And you've got uh, Yafet Koto, yeah. Harry Dean Stanton. And I mean, I love those movies. And even though this one was sillier, but that was part of the fun of it. So I liked getting to do the... Uh, sort of um, Lou Costello in that big sort of overgrown squid movie. <laughs> and, um, and I was a big fan of Treat Williams when I was younger. Mm. Treat was Prince of the City and Hair. I mean, he was, a, I, I always really liked Treat Williams. So it was great working with him. And I got to work with Fomka. It was that the, the second time? And all those other guys. And Wes Studi, who's great, the bad guy. Based on the, your relationship you formed with Steven on that movie, you didn't have to audition for The Mummy? Did he just give you right. a call? You're actually right. I didn't, even though I think it was written before I was around in his mind, and it was written as someone different. I think it was a Frenchman who was short and fat or something like that, and I made him sort of a half-assed Hungarian. You didn't know where he was from, somewhere in that eastern. He, uh, I don't mean being Hungarian's half-assed. I mean, his, the <laughs> He, uh just roaming around the desert. Yeah, and, and so Stephen gave me that part and I went to work on it. That's what I was telling you about uh, one of the times where the costume didn't fit what I was thinking and I had asked to have it change, which is very hard for me to do because I really respected the costumer and he was great. He had like an Australian hat, you know, with the one side flipped up, big boots, and it, he was too much of a tough guy. I said, no, this guy's a weasel. He's like a bird that, a vulture that lives in the desert. Some weaselly creep that's always looking out for himself. So were the all the religious icons, was that your idea as well? Steve let me loose with it. I worked on it and got a bunch of different recordings of different different languages, different people doing different languages, different prayers, and I sort of tried to copy that. And in some cases, I never changed their voice. I showed Steve, but I got the idea of, you know, I think walking backwards. People my age, anybody that was born in the late 80s or 90s, I'll argue anybody down that, at least to our generation, is every bit as impactful as the 32 Karloff. Could you tell at the time 
But you were working on something special? No. I mean, it was great to work on. Mm -hmm. I love Brandon. Rachel Weiss is great. John Hanna was great. Anna Vasta was perfect in that role. I couldn't tell. I mean, I, I, I thought, okay, a mummy movie in 1999. Who knows? I love it. I love that it was Universal. I was mm. so excited. Can you imagine? Yeah. The Universal, movie. The Mummy. So it didn't, when it was a hit, it didn't, I seem to enjoy it now more than I did then. Because now it, I can't believe how many people still seem to really like that movie. It's amazing. It's a great movie. And the fact that it, in retrospect, that it still does so well, and it's got that much comedy aspect built into it is just odd, you know? It yeah, doesn't really at happen. At the time, some people are like, wait a minute. You mm -hmm. know, enough with the comedy. And the, but that's Steve. Steve likes that. Jungle Book, Deep Rising. I wasn't in Jungle Book, but Steve did Jungle Book, which I really like, could be my favorite of all of his films in a way. And The Mummy, that's Steve, that's what he likes. So that's why I think with The Mummy, kids that were 10 saying they really liked it, and then people in their 60s, you know, grandparents are saying, oh, that was a good movie, because it, it wasn't brutal, it wasn't too gory, it wasn't... Everyone you know, could watch it, and you might scare some kids but they could still get away with it you know <laughs> exactly with all the the scarabs yeah you and brendan had such great chemistry on that did you guys work a lot off screen or did it just roll you know i was thinking about that we did we got along very well we kind of clicked that relationship clicked early on i remember when there's a scene where i'm in the office looking through all these papers everyone remember it's weird when you do a movie later when people say what they i've heard people come up to me like i said i'm not super internet savvy i mean i use it all the time but i don't someone came up to me and said you know what scene people love from that you were involved with in the mummy i go what and they say when brendan throws his chair at you i'm like what <laughs> i barely remember that and i'm like oh i make like a little squeal when he hits me which i did in post but you go, okay, anyway, but when he first grabs me and puts me towards like a spinning, um, revolving uh, fan, ceiling fan, mm -hmm. he literally ripped my shirt up. The guy's so strong and the shirt was like tissue. I mean, he ripped my shirt off, but uh, we clicked very early. I don't mm -hmm. think we had much to even discuss about. We clicked that relationship with those two 12 year olds, you know, Brendan's <laughs> character and my character. Yeah who are always trying to one-up each other. Brendan is just an underappreciated actor. I know he's uh, got something going on now, but he's kind of been flowing under the radar. You know what that? he's great in is that, um, I always get the title wrong, but Dazzle, he's great in it. Mm -hmm. And a very underrated movie. I just watched another Harold Ramis movie I thought was really underrated, is Michael Keaton in Multiplicity. It's great. I mean, it's great. Where he plays like five of himself or yeah, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen it myself. You, you should watch it. I will. I love my Because it's Harold Ramis, you know, Groundhog Day yeah. and Vacation and Caddyshack. So, yeah, but this one, people said at the time, oh, it's not as good as Groundhog Day. Well, it's, it's different, but it's a good movie. And so was Brendan's movie that he did with him. Thicken on Stephen Summers, another uh, one that I enjoyed from you guys was Van Helsing. I was involved with Ben Hall. I feel like I was involved more with The Mummy. I was there more. I worked mm -hmm. more. But what was great with Van Helsing, I was very grateful. My brother Chris came down, and my mother, and my brother Dave, and it's my nephew Brian. And they all came down to see Patrick, Catherine, Mary. All of them came down to see the sets because the sets were great. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Giant, great. Oh, my God. They were amazing going to work and I'm in Frankenstein's uh, foyer, you know, or Dracula's foyer. And you're like, oh my God. I mean, a couple of the sets were so big, we had to shoot at night because they wouldn't fit in the soundstage. They were just great. Hugh Jackman was very nice guy, great to work with. Did you have that same feeling that you did with The Mummy, being just working on like a, a monster movie and you're playing, you know, Frankenstein's assistant, even though it's Dracula, but you know, Igor is... Traditionally totally. Frankenstein. I mean, I, you know, it's like amazing. You're mm -hmm. like, I'm at Universal again doing this. Now, a lot of that movie with me was had to do with the makeup. Mm. I was under a lot of makeup. I didn't really want to be in as much, to be honest. But that was something they designed and whatever. I mean, I liked parts of it, but it was just too much, I thought, at the time. I mean, they did a great job, the people putting it out, applying it and everything. But it was okay. I love the costume. I love the I love working on the walk and the talk and it was great. And I love putting a little Bella Lugosi from Son of Frankenstein in there. I put a little bit of that in there. So were you guys on location at all? Or was that all set? No, we were in Prague. Those scenes, I haven't seen it in a while, but you know, like by the bridge where the vampire girls come down and Frankenstein's hiding. Those are, that was like a bridge in Prague. Because a lot of Prague look, I mean, we use sound stages in there too, obviously. But some of the outside of Prague, it looks like period. It looks like a Hammer movie. 
Right. I mean, that movie sometimes looks like a Hammer movie to me. Yeah, I love Hammer films. That might be why I was kind of drawn to that. Yeah, even more than a Universal movie, Mm -hmm. almost. It looks like a Hammer movie. All the colors and the cool sort of... How much time did you spend in makeup on that one? Three and a half hours, and then about another hour and a half to get it off. Was that your most makeup intensive job to date? Yes. I've done other things, but I would love to wear like a nose or wear like something or a chin. And I think that's hard to do in color film. I think you can get away with that in black and white a lot yeah, more. Yeah. You look at De Niro's nose in Raging Bull. I mean, you mm-hmm. don't even know it's a fake nose. But uh, sometimes in color, those things, they're harder to get away with, I think. Would you have preferred the movie in black and white yourself? I never thought about that. I mean, Mm. some of the color stuff is beautiful, and there's that opening in black and white. What did Orson Welles say? The actor's best friend is black and white. There's some truth in that. I really think acting looks better sometimes in black and white. You know what I think about black and white? If someone's really over the top, you know, if someone's in some sort of way over the top comedy, or, or even a drama, and they're just way, way over the top, if you put them in black and white, for some reason, it, it sort of puts a lid on things. I don't know how. It's it tones it down, you know, like makeup yeah, almost. it does. Mm-hmm. It's weird, you know? But yeah, I mean, but still, you look at Plan 9 from Outer Space, yeah. and you're like, okay, that's in black and white. Just but, on, that, on that same subject, quick side. Bar. I don't know if you've seen the uh, people are all in an uproar about the Rob Zombie Monsters trailer and they were not fans. Someone redid the trailer, the same trailer in black and white, and everyone ate it up. So it's just that thing, you know. It's what we're just talking yes. about. <laughs> and especially that since it was originally, the show was in black yeah, and yeah, white. Yeah. I mean, the movie, they, when they did the movie, The Mon- Monsters Go Home, that was in color. And a lot of people don't like that. I like it. I think their makeup looks good. It looks better in black and white because it looks like a comic version of a universal horror movie. It's great. And they have a license to use the makeups. And that's why that show looks, that, The Monsters Show is a great look show great absolutely great great makeup oh man so kevin when you look back over your career is there a specific role that kept you up more at night than the others maybe you pulled your hair out what would you consider your most challenging job i you know i think there will be blood was one of them you know it was intense i did not want to i never want to mess up but it was just intense in a lot of ways i liked doing it but i was glad when it was over because i felt like it went well and i didn't want to trip I, I'm, I was glad to cross the finish line feeling good about it then there's times where i thought i'm trying to think of something that maybe i didn't feel so natural in the role or you know i can't quite think about it now think of so i would say that i did a catch-22 for hulu George Clooney. I was nervous about that because it was from a book, such a great book, such a famous book. And I didn't want to be someone that screwed it. I was playing a Lieutenant Colonel Corn, Colonel Corn, and a uh, great name. And uh, I wanted to please people that read the book and loved the book and wanted to please George Clooney, who directed some of them. But I loved that period, that World War II, you know, I loved Kyle Chandler. Oh my God, because I worked with him in every scene. He's great. So that was one that was, that was one also that I was kind of nervous about a lot. I was very nervous during that shoot. Very glad I did it. How do you deal with that nervousness as an actor? Do you just harness it and use it as fuel? Lance Henriksen, my good friend and great actor, you know, he said, use everything you got, you know, take it as a gift, use it all. It's It's true. I mean, well, there are times if your character isn't supposed to be really nervous or really stressed out, you don't want to show that. But I think if you think about things, if you if you think about what's going on and who you're playing off and and take what they give you. You know, I'm a supporting actor. I'm a character actor. So when I get there and see the lead person, what they're doing, that's part of how I develop my character, too, is based around. I don't want to be a square peg, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to fit into that whole movie, the whole story, the whole tone. I mean, you've seen it, right, Justin, where you're watching a movie and then maybe one character just doesn't doesn't seem to, it seems to be from, you know how people say, that was like from another movie. And it's usually not just the actor's fault. It's maybe the script or the director or whoever. Right. Is there a proper way to go about voicing maybe some differences you may have with the director? Because I know, uh, just off the top of my head, William B. Davis talked with him recently. He said, you know, his job is to service the director, but if he doesn't internally agree with something, he'll just do it anyway. And then just have the director have to tell him afterwards not to do it. (laughs) 
the smoking man right yeah. he was a Can canadian actor yeah you know i just heard about him because he was like the acting teacher of one of those kids in the hall his yeah. name came up who was it i think it was Ke who's the one with the curly hair the kids in the hall? kevin mcdonald yeah I, it's great to see hear other actors i'm always interested in what other actors go through because it's amazing you go oh my gosh i've gone through that justin i'm sorry what did you ask me Oh, no. I don't even... We just started talking about William Davis. Oh, oh about yeah. With the director. Yeah. How, how do, what's the proper way to go it about it? It matters who the director is. Mm. If I feel like I can... You know, I know some people say it's a, it's a director's vision and that's it. And I just heard an actor I really like say, Ed Begley Jr., on an interview. He was saying he does whatever the director wants him to do. That's what, he, And I agree with that to a point. There's a point when some directors are... To me, it gets confusing. I don't quite know what they want, and maybe they, they're not sure what they want. I've had a good relationship with almost all the directors I've worked with, but it is nice when I don't get too many directions. Yeah. <laughs> it's I, just what I prefer. Yeah, I, I mean, imagine. Unless I'm really screwing up, I want them to tell me. But, you know, I think of them as speed bumps sometimes when there's too many. But if they give you one direction during the scene, that's really good. There's an art to that, you know, and if a young director doesn't know how to do, you know, I was with a director and he gave just too many directions. And then I thought I was the only one. And one of the other actors said, are you kidding me? He does it to me, too. <laughs> and the guy, I love the guy. He was great. The director was great. But there were just too many and they felt like speed bumps. I have to make sure I do. I have to make sure because there were too many of them. And so you know, I'm a real Catholic school kid, you know, I want to make sure no one gets angry with me and I do the right thing. But I also have a, a little bit of a crazy side of me that wants to do what I think I know is right too. And the combination of listening to the director, doing what it, but doing kind of what I what I envisioned too. But guys like Paul Anderson and There Will Be Blood and The Master, I think altogether he gave me about six directions for both movies combined. Right. I, I worked with Steve McQueen on... Um, Widows, a movie called Widows, which I have a really nice scene in, where I get beat up and thrown out of a wheelchair. But he gave me one direction. But he gave me a lot of encouragement. You know, Francis Coppola. I worked with Robert Altman. I was lucky enough to work with Robert Altman. I mean, Altman, sometimes you didn't know he was there. It was like somebody, some voyeur watching you, <laughs> which is really interesting. But, you know, if there's a problem, you have to talk to the director. Hopefully you can do that, and there's not a problem. Best acting advice you've received in your career and who gave it to you? What's that James Cagney line, you know? Know your lines and don't bump into the furniture. <laughs> There's some truth to that. I feel like one of the, one of the things I, I, I saw when I was younger, I'd watch these videos of Candid Camera. You know, the old show oh, yeah. that they've redone and ripped off a hundred times since then. Punked and everything else. But the great thing about Candid Camera and I read later, I didn't know this, Paul Newman watched it religiously for these reasons, for acting lessons. The way that people react are honest because they don't know what camera's on them. Exactly. So there are times where I'm doing a, a movie that requires something else, you know, that, you know, maybe deep rising where I'm, I, I want to be believable, but also there's a bit of sort of energized silliness to the whole thing. And you want to put that in there too. But there are other things, you know, I did a movie with Karen Allen, who was great, this movie called Colwell. It's a small film. I remember a friend of mine, Marty, smart guy, great guy, a friend of mine. He came down to the set to see me, and he, I think he was really surprised how quiet the set was. I mean, not quiet like on There Will Be Blood. That was more quiet, intense focus. Mm -hmm. But this was sort of relaxed, and Karen Allen was really sweet, very relaxed. I became more relaxed. Probably not really, because I'm always nervous, but it looked like I was relaxed. And part of that candid camera thing I was talking about was this, that movie, in a nutshell, was about reacting honestly, talking like a real person, looking and acting like a real person. I still felt like I was doing a character, but it was about being natural and being realistic. And I, I've always tried to put a little bit of that into films. I've tried, successful and not successful. I've, I, but, but that movie was really sort of a showcase for that, of just mm -hmm. being low-key, and it was about the script and the director was very much like that Tom Quinn so yeah I don't know if I heard a piece of advice but it's watching the combination for me of watching older films and watching real people is where things I think kind of come together for me have you seen any movies that have moved you recently Once Upon a Time in Hollywood great movie great movie and about people like you like me people that love movies it's, it's a real uh, Tarantino obviously but it's a movie for people that love movies and 70s 60s 70s drive-in fun memories of 
watching those kind of movies with David Carradine or with all those movies, Rolling Thunder, all those movies from the 70s that were so good. And so, and that was sort of a tribute to them all, mm -hmm. I, I thought. But I love that. I'm sure there's other things that I saw that I just can't remember right now. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I watched so many older films. You know, I just watched an Errol Flynn film called Gentleman Jim that was good. And I those are, those are things that I... Uh, You've read a shit ton of scripts over your career. Are there any red flags that jump off the page to you, to any screenwriters out there? Say you look at the first page, is there something that would just make you not even continue? Oh, boy. <laughs> Sometimes I look at a script and I go, it's weird because I'm immediately intimidated. It's just the way I am. I'm immediately nervous. I read it and think, uh-oh. But you got to understand, for me, I'm always coming at the point of from the idea of I'm going to be playing this role or I'm going to be auditioning or I'm going to be doing this role. And I try to get through that role to make sure there's nothing that comes up that's going to make me feel like I shouldn't do the role. Or mm -hmm. or I'm looking for that. Maybe there's something else that you know. And I'm kind of a pessimist that way where I go, oh, oh I can't do this. You know? <laughs> You know, I, I just can't do it. It's such and such, and I, I can't. But there many times I'll read something that maybe I don't particularly love, but I always feel like this isn't for me. I'm not the audience. And I think, but could I still be in this movie? See, that's the difference. So every movie I make, for me, it doesn't have to be, you know, I'm a working actor. I want to work. But it, so it doesn't have to be about what I see this movie. Right. It's great if I want to. Something like Deep Rising or There Will Be Blood or widows or something but there are other things where i go you know i'm not really the audience for this and that's what i feel when i read i mean i feel like sometimes when i read a script that i'm not crazy about maybe the writer's showing off a little bit too much or maybe he's hitting things a little too hard like i read this colwell script with karen allen who got nominated for a spirit award she's the whole show she's great one of the things i loved about the script they were they were united states postal workers they were they were mailmen mail male persons and she worked for the mail for the U u.s post office so did i i was a mailman what i loved about the script was the writer went into such detail about some of the accessories you use at the post office about the, the tape the <laughs> kind of tape the kind of thing how you cut it and people go so what well that shows me that's that person did a lot of research and i love stuff like that because it gets closer and closer to the truth so in other words, if that guy's doing that, there's probably on the other side he's going into the character and that maybe even leads you into the character of those little details of how to package a package and how to put the tape <laughs> on, right? If I read something that looks sloppy or like someone really didn't know what they were talking about, whatever it is, being a cop, being a librarian, then you kind of, you're a little, you're a little skeptical while you read the rest of it. Right. Do your homework is the main thing. But I can't, I don't write scripts. <laughs> <laughs> A it's lot not of times easy. I read it and go, God, this guy wrote this script. It's great. How did he do that? You know? <laughs> then later I'll think of it. Maybe it wasn't so great, but it's great he wrote it. Now uh, I have to ask you a question. Let's hear it. I want to hear some of your favorite movies. Some of my favorite movies. Okay. Well, my all any era. Any era. I'll tell you my all time favorite movie is Dead Poet Society. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah. Horror. Horror, horror movies, man. See, I, I have to break horror down into genres. That's how much I like horror. And do it. B-movies, uh, low-budget horror films. There's a H.P. Lovecraft adaption called The Unnameable. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's got a David Warner and John oh, Reese davies yeah. yeah, love, love. I remember it. that. I don't think I ever saw that. Yeah, you should, you should watch those. Uh, I will. Let's see. Monster Squad. I grew up on the Monster Squad. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. That's, one. Your, that's your age. That's my yeah, age. Yes, I was. I ate that up as a kid. Yeah, I saw that later. I never saw it when it was out. I was like, hey, is that? But I enjoyed it. It was a fun movie. Am I going to get his name wrong? Is that Fred Decker? Yeah, Fred Decker and Shane Black co-wrote uh -huh. it. And I think Decker was the one that directed it. Because he did another B movie. The one with those baby-looking aliens that came down. Uh, Night of the, Night of the Comet. Night of the Creeps. Yeah, Night of the Creeps. Night, right. Night, Night of the Comet's yeah. the other movie. Yeah. Love both of those, yeah. yeah. I just saw her interviewed on a Ilana Douglas show, uh, Kelly Mulrooney. Last Times at Ridgemont High. She was the cheerleader in Night mm -hmm. of the Comet. But yeah, that's, that's really my style right there. What I, in terms of horror, yeah, I grew up on the campy, low-budget sort of horror movies. Where are you from? South Carolina. Is that where you're at now? Yeah, I'm uh, about 30 minutes from Augusta, near the okay. uh, South Carolina, Georgia. I worked area. there once on some film. I can't remember. Yeah, Home of the Masters. Yes, that's right. Of course. Yeah. Well, good. And a shout out to my friend Jeff, who said he's going to watch this. Jeff, what's going on, man? 
yeah. He's a good guy. You can call him Jerf. Jerf. All right, Jerf. Yeah. We had a we had a long my friend and I we had a, a running gag where his dad, who was great, Alfonso, I'd call Jeff up at high school. Hey, is uh Jeff there? This is Kevin. And his dad would go, huh? Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, Jeff, uh, Keith is on the phone. And then he did it again. He said, yeah, it's Ken. And I'd go, oh, Kevin, yeah, whatever. So he still calls me Keith or Ken. <laughs> but anyway, good talking to you, Justin. It was great talking to you too, man. I'll, uh, I'll send you a link once I got this posted and whatnot so Jeff can listen to it. Yeah, I'll listen to some of your other uh, some of your other interviews. Whole, over 150, so. You're the, kidding me. Nope. Plenty to. Good for you. When did you start this? Two years ago. Good for you. Is it fun? You like it? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely would not do it if I didn't. I love talking to actors. Well, we don't, I don't just interview actors. I don't know if you've looked too much into it, but I do researchers and I just musicians. saw a really quickly about a month ago. I saw oh, you know, a lot of people. Yeah, but we're yeah, all I over the place. Special effects guys and mm, all that's kinds. Great. Of that. That's fun. That's a lot of fun. Good for you. That's yeah, good for you. So I'm just gonna keep Congrats. chugging along. Thanks, man. That means it's a lot. fun. Yeah. Awesome. Well, okay, Justin. All right. Well, you have a great day, great night, Kevin. Yeah. Well, <laughs> oh no, it's not it's still light here. It's not that not, not that late. Oh, you're on east. You're on yeah, east coast. Yeah. We're pushing seven yeah. here. Yeah. Okay, Justin. Good enough. Nice talking to you. You too, man. Have a great one. Okay. Bye bye. All right, folks. That's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Kevin. Remember to please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcast. And make sure to tune in next week for another episode. Monsters, madness, and magic. (laughs) Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.